Hi, welcome to Friesland Community Church. My name's Darren, I'm the lead pastor here, and thanks for being with us today. We're continuing in our teaching called 10, Set Free to Live Free. And we're taking a look at the Ten Commandments from the book of Exodus, when Moses went up to Mount Sinai and got the tablets, kind of like if you remember the Charlton Heston Ten Commandments movie. Are they applicable for us today as Christians, or did Jesus do away with them and now we just live under grace? Or have he, has he changed them in some way? We're taking 11 weeks to take a look at these things and more. This week, we're looking at the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Why did God say that? And what does before me mean? We'll take a look at that today. And I just want to share with you, I'm excited about this teaching group of series of teachings because as I've dug into this, it is way more important for us to understand the reality of the Ten Commandments for us as Christians today. Because in all reality, most Christians get it wrong. It's a list of to-do things, to please God. But maybe there's a little bit different because Jesus said, I came to fulfill those commands. We're going to dive into that and we're going to take a look at the first commandment today. But would you please join me as we open in a word of prayer. God, thanks so much for loving us right where we're at, but loving us so much that you're not going to leave us where we're at. God, you know our hearts and so many times they're conflicted and you just desire for us to not be conflicted and you see the pain within us when we are. Lord, help us trust you enough to let go of some of that conflictedness and to put you above all else rather than having competing gods. God, give us ears to hear and a heart to listen today what you're going to share through, to us through your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's this week's message. We are in week two of our series called 10, Set Free to Live Free. We're taking a look at the law, the Ten Commandments. And a couple weeks ago, we started off, and I want to bring you kind of up to speed where we're at so you can catch up. In the beginning, God created mankind. And it says in Genesis 1, 29, he says, So God created mankind to his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female, he created them. And as we look at this verse, we see that God created all of mankind, male and female, to be a reflection of who he is to one another and all of creation. And we're going to take you on a quick, brief history of all the Bible. So we get going and Adam and Eve didn't do it all that well. Their sons, Cain and Abel, one was obedient, one was not. And there was this split into humanity. Faithful to Jesus, not faithful. As the world got on, God saw that all of mankind became wicked. So he sent a worldwide flood, but saved one family, Noah, to be his image bearers. His representatives, his people that he was going to save. And started anew. But that didn't work either because what happened was is things started to progressively get worse again. People started to move away from the Lord and wanted to be their own image bearers. They did not want to be a reflection of the God who created them, but of their own greatness. Then God called Abram, a man that he was going to make a person of great nations. He says in this, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples of earth will be blessed through you. And Abram followed God with faith, not knowing exactly what was going to happen, but he started following not perfectly, but he followed. And then there was misses, but then there was a famine that sent Abraham from the promised land to Egypt. <clears throat> and first it was good for Abraham and his descendants. But as they stayed in Egypt, we see through history that there was Joseph and others, but they became slaves to a, a kingdom 
a people who were not following Yahweh. They had their own gods. They had Ra and all these other gods that were Egyptian gods. And in that ancient Near Eastern culture, there were gods of many nations. Every nation had their god who was powerful, that supplied them. But all the while, God's people stayed faithful to Yahweh in captivity. They cried out to God, save us, save us from the slavery and death of the Egyptians. And God heard their cries and sent Moses. As he sent Moses, he led them out, first through the plagues, and then they got out and they crossed the Red Sea, got away free. Not because they were doing such great things in God's eyes, it was because God himself saved them before ever requiring anything of them. And that's what we touched on two weeks ago, that God first saves, then calls us to who he wants us to be from the very beginning, his image bearers. And we looked at the idea that it was first a nation, Israel. But as Israel waned away from following well and made their own rules up, God sent his son, Jesus, to be the perfect embodiment of his image. And out of that, the church was born, both Jews and Gentiles. And as we sit here today, we are sitting on the feet of Jesus. We are not the nation of Israel. We are the church. There might be people of Jewish history and culture here, but we are the church. We are no longer a nation. We are the church where God has used to be his image bearers, both individually and collectively. He saves us through Jesus, not because of any good works we've done, but because he loves us and has a plan to redeem. We are now a set-apart people, different from the world that we live in. There is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. And as God has said, you will be my image bearers, we are not meant to have to force the kingdom of God on this world. We never will be able to do that perfectly until Jesus comes back. But we can work for the good of the kingdom of this world, showing how following God's rules will be good for the kingdom, even though they are in open rebellion to God's kingdom in many, many places. We are to be representatives, image bearers of the God we worship. But as Israel had problems, we will find today that we have those same struggles. The Ten Commandments, they are not a set of rules that we have to follow to be in the relationship with Jesus. We are in the relationship with Jesus because of him. And it says that no one, in scripture it says, no one who has been given to Jesus will be taken away. And we see this Calvinistic Arminian debate within the church where you can lose your salvation, you cannot lose your salvation. But we come from a reformed heritage where we believe that you really can't lose your salvation. You may not have had your salvation, but you can't lose it because it is not yours and mine to lose. It is Jesus's. Our salvation is his. So the Ten Commandments in a reformed view would not be rules to live by to get into the God's kingdom or to stay in God's kingdom. It is to show the perfect character of who God is to the people around him. We are now being shown through the Old Testament and then perfected by Jesus how we can best be image bearers to the world around us. As we look at the Ten Commandments, we see that it kind of embodies God. God is not a murderer. God is not a liar. He is none of these things that they are shall not do's. So when we don't do those things and embody them, we are looking like our creator. See, when we love God and love others, our greatest desires are realized. You and I, we have these desires, these competing desires in our body, in our, in our whole, wholeness, because we want to do what we want to do, but there is something down deep in every human that does want to do this as well. Nobody wakes up in the morning, I want to go murder someone. 
It is our emotions that take over typically. Or there is something very wrong in us if that is where we're thinking. We want to do this because we were created to do this, but we are messed up. All of us are messed up. So as we come into today's talk, we're going to look at the first commandment and what looks at right before it. We're going to read the Heidelberg Catechism together, and I'll, I'll read the question, and then uh, you will read everything else that the answer. What does the Lord require in the first commandment? That not I to endanger my own salvation, avoid and shun idolatry, sorcery, superstitious rites, and prayer to saints or other creatures, that I rightly know the only true God, trust him alone, and look to God for every good thing, humbly and patiently, and love, fear, and honor God with all my heart. In short, that I give up anything rather than go against God's will in any way. Yes, that statement says we don't want to endanger our own salvation, but it is not, again, ours to lose. But we don't want to endanger having been saved. So your desire and my desire as a Christian should be to follow these, not just to the letter of the law, but to the spirit of the law. As we continue, Exodus says this, and this is um, right after our, right before our passage. So before Moses goes up to the Mount, uh, Mount Sinai to get the words from God, he says this to Moses now, or Moses and the people of God. Now, if you obey me fully, keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and holy nation. You catch that? If we follow his laws, we are intermediaries. We are intercessors for the world. Even though the whole world is his, he created it. The people of God are priests. They are we are to be sharing God's kingdom to the world around us. So let's read the, the beginning of the Ten Commandments. We're going to read Exodus 20, 1 through 3. Just a few short verses. And it's on page 69 of the Bible in your pew. It says, And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Out of the land of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. That's it. Short and sweet. No other gods before me. God is saying to his people, listen, I know there's a lot of gods. You came out of Egypt. There was a God for everything. But I am the one true God. And you see why he's saying this? Because right at the beginning... He says that I defeated the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You know those gods in Egypt that they think are so powerful? I defeated them. Me. I'm the one who sent the plagues. I'm the one who killed all the firstborn. Me. I saved you. I'm the one who parted the Red Sea. It had nothing to do with their gods. Their gods did nothing. To stop you from leaving. The people may have tried, but their gods, I defeated them easily. So don't think that another god is even close to as powerful as me. I am it. But also we see that God has acted first. And because God has acted first by saving them, this is how they should live to become that kingdom of priests, which we talked about in chapter 19. They are to be a priest of all nations. So he is calling these people not just to freedom, he's calling them to a position as well. Hey, I'm giving you freedom, yes, but I want so much more for you. You, my people, will share me with the world 
and hopefully do it well. But we know the history of Israel. They didn't do it so well. This first and greatest commandment, they didn't do it very good. They were continually going after other gods. Yeah, they worshiped God, Yahweh, but they also had a both and. Well, I'm worshiping God, but I, this other God, I'm just kind of hedging my bets over here with this one. Solomon, all the, the kings, they ended up going away, marrying women from other nations, and then worshiping and letting their gods into their kingdom, negating the first commandment. We sit here today, and we say, Yes, we believe that, but we struggle with this too. The first commandment we often break, as even the church. But it still stands. We shall have no other gods before me. Why? Because if you're worshiping or trusting in another god, they're not going to be able to help. God, Yahweh, Jesus is the only one who has the power And we can sit here and look back on the Israelites and go, you guys are dumb. Why didn't you just trust? But as we're going to see in a moment, we're kind of like them at some times. At this point, when God gave the law, scholars believe they were about 60 days into their journey to the promised land. They're kind of hoping that's where their journey took. Nobody knows for sure. But it's 60-some days into their journey. About two months into the journey, going from slavery to the promised land. So this isn't years later. This is two months after they've seen God miraculously do amazing things. Think back two months in your life. What are some really things that you remember just not even two months ago? And... The salvation should be very fresh in their minds. And it was. So they were joyously going, yes, we will do this. But again, years went by and it got harder. Another thing God knows that the Israelites don't know at this place. Yes, you had those gods in Egypt that you saw me defeat. But where you're going, they also have gods. These different nations, they have a ton of different gods. You will be going to the place where I call you to. You will encounter new gods all the time. But they are not real gods. These people worship false gods. And you are to be my representatives to those people. A representative needs to be like those they represent. We look at our, our Congress and stuff today where they're supposed to be in the House of Representatives. They're supposed to represent the will of the people in their congressional district. We, as Christians, are supposed to be representing the will of our Father in heaven to look like him, act like him, talk like him, that if a person would to see us and then experience Jesus personally, they would say, that is just like him. That is just like him. So that is a tall order for us as Christ followers. But God is gracious. His mercy is more, and we continually live into the reality of who God has already declared us to be. As we get further and further into the Ten Commandments, that every commandment that God gives is to make himself more known through us, but every commandment following gets its meaning from this one. Every commandment. Why? Because if we don't put him first, all these other commandments, they don't really mean much at all. And if we don't get in our minds that we are representatives of the one true God, we can go in and be good intentioned people, but not point them to Jesus. As we, as the church, set out to be more and more like Jesus. We need to continually remember that. And he even called the nation of Israel at one point 
to wear the Shema on their head. They would say, put these things in your minds. Keep them on your forefront. Teach them to your children. We are called to remember because we often forget. And that's why we do things like the Heidelberg Catechism. That's why we listen to sermons, to remind us of who we are in Jesus and how we should act because of it. Not necessarily to get in, but because of we are already in. But again, we still have that same challenge and problem that the Israelites did. There are other gods of the nations we live in calling us, telling us that I am better. Trust in me. And our gods look a little bit different. There's very few of us in America today in a post-Christian society that would be superstitious. There are some. I heard a story last night at a wedding that there was these co-ops of different, um, different things, and there was a guy putting a hex on one of the the co-op's doors. He was putting a spell. He believed in a different God. It's there. It's out there. But most of us would not necessarily believe that. We have something much more sneaky that sneaks into our worlds. While they aren't true gods, we put our trust in money. We put our trust in family. And these in and of themselves are not bad things. But when they're made God things, that our hope is in them, that's where we get into trouble. We now shift worshiping God alone to God and. I worship Yahweh, but I also hold a lot of, lot of things for my money. My 401k, my pension. I'm putting my trust in that thing. I'm putting my trust in my family. I'm putting my trust in you. Insert your thing here that competes for your trust. We all have them. And it's always good for us to go, what is the thing that's luring me, trying to lure me away from Yahweh? That maybe I'm a much more bigger proponent of sometimes than Jesus. We live in a world that is not perfect. Our kingdom The kingdom of God is ruling and reigning in heaven now and not fully realized here. We are foreigners in a foreign land being representatives of the kingdom of God. We're not to be combative, but we are trying to work for the good of the kingdom we live in. In Matthew, Jesus says this, no one can serve two masters. He's saying, listen, if you've got competing gods, you're serving one and not the other. Either you will have hate, you either will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And he's speaking about money here, but he says you cannot serve both God and money. And again, money in itself is not bad. The love of money is where we get into trouble. Jesus is saying in this passage right here that we need to be very careful. What are we letting in to be our God's? And in our world, in our day and age, it's much more sneaky than Ra or Hercules or whatever these gods that were in the ancient Near Eastern cultures. We serve a much sneakier enemy. And all of a sudden, we can be enticed to go down that road, and now we're trying to serve both and. But Jesus says, it won't ever work out for you. In Deuteronomy They say again, love the Lord God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. He's saying if you do that, there will be no other room for these other so-called gods. As I said before, the church, we are a priesthood of believers. We are now his representatives, collectively and individually. In 1 Peter, Peter says this, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We, this is what we're called to. We are a priesthood of believers trying to share 
the goodness of the God that we worship. And make no mistake about it, we live in a very pluralistic society. Very pluralistic. It's okay, they're saying, but it's not. And the church needs to get that. We can't be lured into that. We don't need to be combative and angry at the world who is worshiping false gods. We need to show them the goodness of worshiping Yahweh. Sharing God's good word. And hopefully they have eyes to see and ears to hear what God is sharing through each and every one of us. As we wrap up, we see that God alone deserves our praises. Many of you have been through hard times. And you've seen God move. Looking back, and again, it is one of those things where we very rarely see God's presence and is carrying us in the midst of our hard times. But afterwards, when we look back, we go, wow, was he super present. And that is why the church is so needed and powerful. Because every one of us in this place are in a different space in this moment. Some of us are going through health struggles. Some of us are, are having this great mountain of faith right now. And some of us struggle, some of us are strong. And how the church functions best is when we can come around those of us who are struggling and encourage one another. Not just giving them platitudes, but being with them, encouraging them, showing God's love to one another. We've had so many people in our our community pass away this last weekend. How do we as the church show God them God's love. Because Jesus said, when asked, what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. And when asked who my neighbor was, it wasn't your real neighbor. It was those who were around you. So as the church seeks to be a priesthood of believers to each other in the world around us, we can make a big impact because we have the Holy Spirit living in each and every one of us. And I encourage you today to take a look. Where is God calling you to be that priesthood to someone in your community? But all the while, as we go into that, knowing full well, it needs to start with praising God and God alone because he is worthy of our praise. Let's pray. God, You've said in your word that you are near to us. And as we gather, you are in our midst. And we pray as we've heard this message today that we are encouraged to live out who you've already called us to be, that priesthood. Lord, I, I may have the title of pastor, but each and every one of this people that believe in you and put you as their Lord and Savior are pastors, priests to the world around them wherever they're at. Lord, I pray as I equip our saints and help and our leadership equips our congregation to live out who you're calling us to be, that we are a light in a dark land, that we are comforting those who know you, but also reaching out to those who don't. God, may this place, these people, be a people that are different, holy, set apart to be the priest that you've called both Israel and the church to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. And we pray your time with us was blessed and encouraging. And we'd love for you to join us here in person in Friesland on a Sunday morning. Next week, we start our summer schedule, June 4th. And it's going to be at 9 a.m. instead of 10 a.m. So if you show up at 10 a.m., you'll probably catch coffee hour, but you won't catch the message and the service. So we'd love for you to join us 9 a.m. next Sunday. And that's going to be happening all the way from June all the way to the end of August. Here's this benediction as we get ready to depart together. This is out of the book of 1 Peter. Therefore, 
Prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you once had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. We hope you have a great week. We'd love to see you in person. Bye.